India has end-to-end -end capabilities in nuclear energy. Gets its own fuel, makes its own reactors, reprocesses, and has tremendous capability. The finance minister announced a big nuclear energy mission. I have with me Mr. Rafael Crossi. He is the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency based in Vienna. We call him the global nuclear watchdog. Thanks a lot for speaking to us. My pleasure. Mr. Rossi, India announced 100 gigawatts of nuclear energy in the next 25 years. Yes. As the head of the Indian International Atomic Energy Agency, does that excite you? I can only welcome that. But let me say that uh, more than uh, praising this as something extraordinary, I think that that is the right thing to do. Uh, India is um, one of the uh, emerging global powers. Its economy is one of the biggest in the world, uh, requiring uh, ever growing amounts of energy to sustain this growth. And of course, uh, you don't have uh, dozens of possibilities in order to sustain this effort. Quite obviously, nuclear energy, due to its reliability, due to its uh, dispatchability, due to its flexibility, uh, provides India with a very, um, I would say, appropriate element in the factor in the equation. It's not the only source of energy. India is also uh, multiplying renewable energy and other sources, but quite clearly being the, um, I would say, paradigmatic baseload energy, CO2 free, um, a, a decisive move. India already has a vast uh, fleet of nuclear reactors, but when we look at the overall uh, pie chart of how much nuclear energy represents in this great nation is still minimum. Yes, it's very still, minimum. It's still that. So I think this um, quite steep increase reflects uh, a wise decision to put this um, uh, equation in a more balanced way. Do you think India can reach 100 gigawatts by 2047? I'm told if we do that, we would be consuming about 25% of the world's uranium. Well, you were there in Niger recently. Yes. Is there enough uranium in the world to feed India? There is. There, there is. is. There is, absolutely there is. So two, two points you mentioned. Uh, is India capable of doing that? Absolutely, yes. If there is a country that can do it, it's India. I mean, India has uh, the technological base, it has the industrial base, it has the manpower. So I don't feel uh, that there is any obstacle, maybe any major obstacle uh, preventing you from getting to that uh, incremental growth. In terms of the uranium, uh, we should not forget that uranium mining uh, has not reached its full potential. We have a handful of countries, you, you know them, that have been very active, but a lot of prospection is being carried out in, in, in the world. I was just, as you mentioned, in, in, in Niger, but uh, we see it in Kazakhstan, in Australia, in Russia, in the United States, in South America, uh, in many other countries, including in India, where um, uh, uranium mining is poised to grow in the next uh, few years. So I don't think we have a, 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 an issue here in terms of um, availability of resources. As per the assessment of the International Atomic Energy Agency, of which you are the Director General, are India's nuclear reactors safe? Well, absolutely. When you look at the track record of uh, the uh, Indian uh, nuclear fleet, we see it as a flawless uh, operation. Of course, safety comes first, and safety uh, is, is a constant effort. You can never say, I got it. And, uh, and and I can relax or, or, or lower my guard. That can not, never happen. But what we see here is a sector that is very professional um, uh, and that has continued uh, working in this in this way for many many years. So I don't see any reason why this would change. But of course, it requires zeal, constant 
uh, attention. Do you think having an independent nuclear regulator, which does not answer to the Department of Atomic Energy Agency, would be the way forward if India wants to do 100 gigawatts in the next well, 25 years? This is clearly the best practice. This is clearly the best practice because, and, and, I, and I see it all over the world, uh, the, uh, the independent regulator is very, very important because you must have um, a technical body that talks truth to power and that indicates when the fleet may require some adjustments or uh, in this way, this is the way in which we uh, teach um, safety culture and security culture. In this way, you can be sure that you are going to have a system that is really objective. So you met Dr. Monty. Have you urged him to have a more independent nuclear no, I don't regulator? Think, I don't think he needs any urging. Uh, he knows uh, uh, this activity very well. And I think uh, the, the Department of Atomic Energy in India is working uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very good way. Uh, we have a very close relationship with him. The finance minister in India also announced the setting up of five small modular reactors. Yes. SMR seemed to be the sexy fashion for the <laughs> world in nuclear. After big, it has become small. We don't see SMR well, let me working SMRs in big numbers. No, Why no. are they so fashionable? Well, they are fashionable, fashionable because they have a number of characteristics that make them really attractive. First, in the name, uh, smaller and being smaller, um, uh, faster and easier to uh, um, uh, be rolled out, to be introduced. Um, uh, maybe also more accessible to, to all the economies, I would say, to a global power like India, but also to medium size and even developing countries makes it uh, very interesting. When you say we don't see them in, in great numbers, well, this is precisely because it, it's a technology that is coming to uh, maturity. It's being licensed. We see, though, I should, I should point out, uh, we, we have some cases in China, in Russia of uh, SMRs that are already operating, and we are close to having them in um, the United States, for example. Europe is also moving, and so I'm very glad to see that obviously India uh, is looking into this as well. Um, SMRs are going to be very useful. I would not say that it, it's something that is going to be replacing the traditional nuclear power plants as we know it. It's going to be an addition. It's a different, it's a different tool. From your toolbox, uh, you have a hammer, you have a uh, a screwdriver, you have different things. Um, uh, an SMR is good for certain activities. You may have heard of the um, growing interest from uh, AI and IT big uh, companies in the world for SMRs because they need uh, enormous amounts of electricity constantly. And, and so when you look at the possibilities that you may have, it, it becomes a very obvious uh, choice. Uh, we are standing with Mahatma Gandhi behind us, the apostle of peace. Yes. The IAEA was set up for atoms for peace. Indeed. But many say IAEA has failed the world. And I'm using that word carefully. And let me explain why. Non-proliferation, number of countries have increased. You have put walls around peaceful use of nuclear energy so high mm -hmm. that climate change has become a big problem. On both fronts, it seems the agency you head from the United Nations has not delivered the goods it was supposed to. What do you have to say? Well, I, uh, that's a particular way to see things. I happen to see it from a different perspective. And let me explain how. Um, uh, true that when it comes to non-proliferation, we have seen the number of countries um, possessing nuclear weapons grow. I would still contend that that growth has been quite contained. Uh, when you look at the amount of countries benefiting from nuclear technology, using nuclear uh, energy and nuclear technology without uh, the the NPT without the IEA without the safeguard system we would we would count them by the dozens, uh, thus adding to international instability. Then the IEA is 
also an instrument to facilitate the introduction of nuclear energy through its uh, safety standards, through its security work um, in the area of applications. The inspiring uh, uh, figure of uh, Gandhi is, is also there to show us that technology is put at the service of mankind, cancer care, food and nutrition the protection of the environment, so many things that are possible through nuclear technologies and applications. So I wouldn't be so severe <laughs> as you are in terms of the, um, uh, of the balance. I don't want to be uh, starry-eyed um, uh, either. I think one has to dedicate every day an effort. And this is a little bit what we are doing here in India this time around looking at uh, uh, the, the nuclear program, but also, as I will be doing in Mumbai, going to cancer centers and looking at them. You're also visiting the 700 megawatt nuclear uh, reactor. Exactly. Kartapa. Very, very, very keen on doing that. So it's a gamut of things. And I believe that this agency has proven that you can be an international organization that is very effective. Now, today we are seeing a complete meltdown of the non-proliferation order with President Donald Trump pulling his hands almost out of NATO. What role will IAEA play in stabilizing that more well, nuclear never, weapons are not going to happen across Europe? A never increasing one because when you have these tensions uh, in the rise, um, it is clear that, um, and we see the discussion, uh, not only in Europe, but closer to home here in some countries in Asia, there are some who are wondering, asking themselves, why wouldn't they themselves um, uh, have uh, nuclear weapons? And this is where uh, the strengthening of the non-proliferation rule and norm uh, is so necessary, so that when we are in countries that have nuclear reactors, that have nuclear technology, this is not an, a direct pathway to, uh, nuclear weapons. to nuclear weapons. Now, one point where you've been a friend of India, I know that, we've interacted earlier in your earlier capacities. Uh, one pressure point and one point for, pinch point for India is the membership for the Nuclear Suppliers yes. Group. Yes. I know as the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, you have a different role. You were once uh, head of the nuclear suppliers group. Do you think time India was made a full member of the nuclear suppliers group? I think, well, when precisely when I was presiding over this very important export control regime, um, I was working with India and with other countries that were aspiring to, to join because they felt that in spite of the fact that they were not parties to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, they had become, as India has, a global player in nuclear. So um, my idea was that all those actors that are playing an important role um, um, independently from their membership in a, an export control group should be part of the effort. And this was why we were as close as has ever happened uh, to, to membership at that time. I think energy or not energy, India is a global nuclear player. I think it is, makes eminent sense that it joins um, groups that are working together, that are trying to foster a culture of responsibility when it comes to, the, to dealing with, this, uh, with these technologies. In any case, my friendship with India, energy or not energy, energy continues, and this is why I'm here. Wonderful. One area where India wanted to have more nuclear plants was mm -hmm. through international collaboration. Yes. With America, with France, uh, with Russia, it continues. But it was the liability regime and the liability act which came into play. And let me ask you bluntly, the world order and the nuclear liability regime is industry friendly. The Indian liability act is people friendly. One, do you think the Indian Liability Act needs to change or the no. World Act needs to be changed to make it more citizen-friendly? Well, you're putting this in, in a mutually exclusive way, which is very rationally, very tempting to go into that, but I will not. Because I believe that 
uh, in, in any event, you need a liability regime. And of course, um, the characterization of the liability regime as people-friendly or industry-friendly is a bit subjective, with all due respect. I believe that there are set different instruments. It's a very arcane, as you know, um, uh, part of uh, nuclear law um, as to uh, which instrument, which convention applies to whom. I think it is obvious that we need to have a strong liability regime. If we have an industry that is growing, we have to give the society and the operators the um, guarantees that in, in, in the uh, quite remote, uh, because it has been uh, quite remote, uh, the case of a nuclear accident, there will be adequate compensation. I think it is a logical um, uh, consequence of that. So who do you need to, who needs to change, the international regime or the Indian regime? We need to converge. How do we do that? We do that by talking to each other. We do that by participating, like the IAEA does, constantly inviting India to come and to, and to join us, uh, to compare notes and to see, you know, you were, you, you were talking about the growth of the Indian nuclear sector. And we have seen that there are things changing here. There are partnerships that are being um, the private sector is coming in. Established. So I believe that there is going to be an evolution. I'm very optimistic about that. Are you optimistic about thorium? Because India is very optimistic about thorium. Thorium has been a, a trademark uh, in, in India, having uh, the, you know, most of the world reserves in, in thorium. Um, the nuclear fuel cycle internationally has been concentrating on uh, uranium mostly. Um, and so you have this uh, structure there, but I believe that in the future it cannot be excluded that thorium will be actively integrated into nuclear operations. So worldwide. nuclear energy will play a big role in the world energy ecosystem. It will be bigger. We are not we are not advocating dominance of nuclear energy. We advocate an intelligent uh, nuclear sorry uh, energy mix for countries. Thanks a lot for speaking to me. I thank you very much. Always a pleasure speaking to you, Great Rafael pleasure. Grossi. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that was Rafael Grossi, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the global nuclear watchdog. Optimistic about nuclear energy, but use it intelligently in the nuclear in the energy mix. A friend of India supported India's membership for the Nuclear Suppliers Group and here in India to visit some nuclear plants as well. India wants to ramp up nuclear energy to 100 gigawatts by 2047. A steep rise. It would be very useful. India is very energy hungry. In New Delhi, Palav Bagla for NDTV.